Our next presenter is Rebecca Kiernan. Uh, she is a principal resilience planner with the city of Pittsburgh. Um, she has her master's of science in public policy management from also from Carnegie Mellon University. At the city, uh, Ms. Kiernan's focus is on developing and implementing a portfolio of initiatives that build Pittsburgh's social, ecological, economic, and physical resilience to citywide shocks and stresses. Please welcome Rebecca Kiernan. I'm very honored to be here um, and truly humbled to be a part of this uh, incredible lineup of speakers today. So I just wanted to start out with that. Um, uh, so in 2016, um, as Tim mentioned earlier this morning, the city of Pittsburgh became uh, designated as a biophilic city. Um, and so uh, I pulled up this quote from the mayor from 2016. You can see Tim giving the mayor a proclamation, which was very exciting for us. Um, and this designation, I should also mention, is a, is a, is a partnership with the Phipps Conservatory. Um, and so uh, we are partnering together on this initiative, which is pretty exciting. Um, and I pulled up this quote from the mayor because I thought that this would kind of preface the rest of the direction that I was going to go in today with this presentation. Um, so being part of the Biophilic Cities Network will help us realize the goals in our own 2030 plan. It will help us to coordinate the efforts of the great organizations that work in the city of Pittsburgh on a daily basis. It will do what David Lawrence set out to do in the 1940s, which was to make Pittsburgh a shining example of how a post-industrial city can take care of its air, water, but most importantly, take care of its people. Uh, and so there were a lot of directions that I could have gone with this presentation today, um, but uh, I decided to go with a little bit of our resilience work um, and so uh, these are the guiding foundational principles that, that uh, we've developed. Uh, so we started out with P4. What that means is people, planet, place, and performance. Um, so that is something that we uh, use as a framework for the city and everything that we do. Um, in 2016, we developed a preliminary resilience assessment followed by a resilience strategy. So we took that assessment and tried to figure out how to actionize it. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we did two years of the Pittsburgh Equity Indicators Report. Um, and then uh, in 2018, we developed an investment prospectus, which looked at the resilience strategy, took it down to the project level, and then it did a cost analysis from that. Um, and then in 2019, uh, we, we ad uh, formally adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. So we were the second city in the US to formally adopt those. Um, and then our climate action plan is kind of the other side of the work that we do. So resilience, uh, and I'll get into the definition in a minute, is very much focused on uh, sort of adaptation side, um, whereas our climate action plan is also focused on, on the mitigation side of, of climate change. Um, and so uh, we released the climate action plan th version 3.0, so this is our third version, in 2019. Um, we, our chapters include uh, buildings, energy, water, transportation, waste, food and agriculture, and urban ecosystems. So this is very focused on how do we reduce our emissions profile in those six different ways. Um, and in particular, I want to highlight that urban ecosystems includes a 100% sequestration increase target. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what that what that looks like in our next greenhouse gas inventory. We're also going to um, try to figure out how to include uh, sequestration in that. Um, and it, our 2030 goals, these are kind of our guiding principles. Um, we have 100 percent renewable energy use uh, in our facilities. Uh, so city, the city owns and operates about 130 buildings. 50% um, building energy use reduction and 50% water use reduction in our, in our facilities, 100% fossil fuel free fleet for the city fleet, 100% waste diversion, that's citywide. Um, so zero waste is uh, with, our, with our residents as well. 50% uh, transportation emissions reduction and then a divestment strategy for our pension fund. Uh, so those are all things that we're working on. Um, so I wanted to get a little bit grounded in what resilience means to us. Uh, and so urban resilience, the definition that we use is the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a city to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what kinds of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. So chronic stresses are those slow burning issues that kind of erode the capacity of the city on a daily basis. 
Um, whereas acute shocks are those one-time uh, disastrous type of events. And we think about all of this in the global megatrends of urbanization, globalization, and climate change. Um, and so I want to preface here that my, I live in shocks and stresses. And so when I was trying to figure out what direction I was going to take this presentation, um, I could have highlighted a lot of really great things that we're doing with biophilia. But I figured if you invited a resilience planner, I'm going to talk about resilience. Um, so I apologize if I kill the mood. But I'll bring it back. <laughs> Um, and so uh, we developed the city of Pittsburgh's uh, shocks and stresses profile as part of our preliminary resilience assessment. Uh, and so the shocks that, that we anticipate um, are related to climate change and extreme weather. Oh, and I should say that the, the bubbles that we have here are the amount of times that we heard about this issue through extensive public engagement um, or uh, kind of mixed with some of the, re the ex extensive research that we did throughout this process. Um, so climate change and, and extreme weather events uh, is our number one anticipated shock, uh, followed by infrastructure failure, a hazmat incident, economic collapse, landslide and subsidence, and disease outbreak and pest infestation. Um, and our, on our stresses side, uh, we have economic and racial inequity, uh, fragmentation, and uh, what fragmentation means is uh, here in Pittsburgh, we have 131 municipalities in Allegheny County. Uh, we have 90 different neighborhoods within the city of Pittsburgh. A lot of that is uh, divided by topography and, and bridges. God forbid you should have to cross a bridge. Uh, and then we also have 3,200-ish nonprofits that operate within city limits for a population of 305,000. So there's a lot of different entities that are working on a lot of different things. Um, and so that's what fragmentation means. Um, aging infrastructure and environmental degradation. So that's poor air, water, and soil quality. Um, and what we start to see is that, you know, we're, we consider ourselves kind of more of a stressful city. So we're not coastal, we're not anticipating sea level rise or anything of that nature. Um, although we do have a lot of challenges that I will get into. Um, but what we've, uh, what we try to address is that you can see how if you leave a stress unchecked, it will turn into a shock. So for example, aging infrastructure is a giant bubble on the stress side. Um, a bubble on the stress side of shock, of, on the shock side is infrastructure failure. Um, so if you leave a bridge uh, long enough after its, its due date, it will uh, collapse. Um, and we've seen a little bit of, of that here. Um, and so the things that I uh, wanted to focus on is addressing stresses to increase resilience to shocks and connect people to healthy, natural spaces. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about the current conditions of our green spaces, um, the changes in climate that, we're, that are currently occurring in Pittsburgh and the impacts that we're beginning to, beginning to experience, um, and then opportunities to create systemic change in the way that we maintain public land. Um, so this is all kind of part of a new project that I'm, I'm working on. So this is like my first roadshow um, uh, on an adaptation planning process. Uh, and so uh, Pittsburgh is still, I want to kind of ground us in, in uh, current conditions in Pittsburgh, right? Um, and so we're still kind of recovering from our industrial past um, and subsequent disinvestment. Um, and so this map on the left, this is my favorite map. Uh, so this is Allegheny County, and it's the hydrology of Allegheny County. Um, so you can see all the great rivers and streams. And that gray blob in the middle is the city of Pittsburgh, um, by 1910, we, have, we had piped uh, all of our natural hydrology underground. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what we're dealing with here. Um, uh, 1940, there's that picture of, of Pittsburgh during the uh, Industrial Revolution. You can see that uh, the air quality wasn't that great. Um, so we've made some pretty great strides, you know, since that time period. Um, but a lot of that was due to economic collapse from the collapse of the steel industry. Um, and so one of the issues from that collapse of industry um, was a halving of our population. So we were we maxed out at 680,000 people um, around 1950. And then uh, today we're at 305,000 people. And so what that did was it reduced the tax base. Um, by 1990, we had a reverb effect. Um, so we went from a staff of about 6,000 city employees to a staff of 3,000 city employees um, by the 90s. 
Uh, we used to own things like the Phipps Conservatory and the zoo. Um, and so that's how, you know, Phipps turned into this great nonprofit. Um, this is not a city run building, obviously, because it would be very different. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so, so just, just to understand, you know, kind of the context around uh, city maintenance and how things get deferred. Uh, and so we've done some analyses. Um, the, the map on the left is a map of uh, access to green space. Um, you can see it, it, it's not bad. Um, the red areas are about a point file, point five, half a mile walk shed um, to uh, access to green space. Um, and from our equity indicators report, we kind of see that there's not really an issue of access to green space um, equity wise. Uh, but we, we do know from the rest of the equity indicators report and other subsequent reports that health outcomes don't really align with the idea of this benefit to green space. Um, and so uh, what basically what this is showing is that not all green space is, is uh, created, well, it was created equally, but uh, it wasn't maintained equally. Um, and so uh, because of disinvestment, uh, not all of our spaces are functioning as they should. But, um, and so here's some of our spaces. Uh, so we have uh, the Hazelwood Greenway. We have a greenways system uh, within the city. Um, there's about six or 700 acres uh, within the greenways system. Uh, it started out in the 1980s uh, as really steep hillsides um, and uh, houses that had been uh, you know, abandoned. And so the city was able to take on those properties and turn it into a permanent conservation easement. Um, but those, that Greenway system is not funded. It's stewardship based. Um, and so you can see Hazelwood Greenway has actually a really good stewardship group. Um, but you can see that it's getting swallowed by um, invasives. There's a lot of challenges in our greenways. They're dumping grounds um, and they're not funded, which is really unfortunate. Um, so, the one below is Highland Park. So we have an incredible park system um, that's, uh, you know, maintained by our Department of Public Works and also in partnership with the Parks Conservancy, which is really great. Um, and what this is showing is there's a fenced area around um, all that green space, uh, the undergrowth in between there. So we have lots of trees um, and then we have lots of green space within a uh, a fenced in area. And so uh, we did a study in 2010 um, that looked at our park systems and, and analyzed how many deer, what the deer density was there. Um, there are 82 deer per square mile in 2010 in Highland Park. Um, that's huge. Uh, and so what this is basically showing is that deer are an issue, uh, deer browse is an issue, and it's very hard for us to be able to establish any plants in this ecosystem. Um, that would provide the ecosystem services that we really need in these spaces. Um, and then uh, related, t uh, Tim Nuttall, who's here, um, also discovered that Riverview Park happens to have a worm problem. Um, and so as I understand it, uh, worms, snake worms, are, which are invasive, uh, are attracted to deer feces. Uh, and they, if you've ever seen worm castings, it breaks up the soil pretty well. Um, and so uh, it eats all the, all the ground cover, right? Um, and so as a result, what we're also seeing now is a significant amount of landslides. So um, you could see how you know, not taking care of our ecosystems is really starting uh, to hurt us here. Um, and so let's see. Uh, caring for our, our ecosystems has been a collective effort. I've kind of mentioned this. So Greenways, uh, our Greenway system is unfunded. Uh, it's focused on community stewardship that's run out of city planning. Um, our parks, City P DPW and Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy and PWSA are doing really great work in those parks. Um, Tree Canopy, our City uh, Department of Public Works, Tree Pittsburgh, Tree Vitalize, we have a lot of nonprofits that work in the space. Um, our vacant lots, uh, we have uh, an adopt a lot toolkit uh, so residents can adopt a lot near them. Uh, we have a lot of nonprofit organizations that work in vacant lots, and then sometimes we have DPW um, and city planning runs that program. Um, and then our streets. So we have a uh, city department of, Motor of mobility and infrastructure and Pittsburgh Water and Sewer, Sewer Authority have an operate streets. But basically what this is, is we have a lot of green space. Um, 
there's a lot of potential there. Uh, and so I'm gonna go real quickly because I only have two minutes uh, into uh, some of the, so we're focused, we're very focused on climate change. Um, and so I, I showed you the shocks and stresses bubbles. We are starting to see some of those shocks now. And so these are, this is kind of our preliminary, very preliminary analysis that we've pulled together with a really terrific intern that I have. Um, and so uh, first of all, you can see, uh, and so this is related to climate change and extreme weather. Um, you can see that our annual precipitation in Pittsburgh is increasing and 2018 was the wettest year on record. Uh, we also are experiencing some infrastructure failure. So these are 311 uh, complaints about flooding. You can see that they are, uh, they're not reserved to any one specific area. They're everywhere. That's the sewer that explodes by my house. <laughs> um, Pittsburgh is experiencing higher highs, lower lows, and more extreme temperature swings. Um, and so that freeze thaw, that quick freeze thaw, has a lot of problems for us. Um, one of them is a, a significant increase in landslides. Um, and so we're seeing landslides occur more frequently. Um, they're also occurring on public property. So we're trying to start to analyze, okay, what is it that we can actually uh, take care of on our own? Um, so that freeze thaw plus that, in, that intense rain, we're having a lot more rain and all of those factors are really um, wreaking havoc on our hillsides. Um, and then um, inversion events are increasing. So for anybody that's not from here, um, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, but inversion events are when a warm air system comes in and the cold air gets trapped with all of the pollutants down at the bottom because of our topography. Um, and so uh, we are starting to see more and more inversion events um, as a result of uh, what we believe is climate change. Um, and uh, that is also you know, compounded by local industry and local planned industry in our area that will impact air quality as well. Um, so that's a problem. Um, but I think that there's a really big opportunity, and I like this map a lot, and it's not even complete because I think that we need to add uh, medians and other city facilities and grounds uh, and our streets um, as potential assets here. Uh, so what you're looking at is uh, our tree canopy coverage, you're looking at our park system, you're looking at our greenways. This is all an opportunity to really optimize the green space that we have and tackle the challenges that I just discussed. Um, so I think that you know, we should be really thinking about natural infrastructure as our first line of defense against a, change, a changing climate and we should be resourcing it that way. Uh, and so there's some really good projects that are going on. I showed you that really terrible map of, uh, that I love of the hydrology of Pittsburgh. Um, there's some really good work in stormwater that's planned that is separating uh, you know, stormwater from sewer systems and daylighting streams that's really excellent by the Parks Conservancy and the Water and Sewer Authority. Um, I think that we also need to be thinking in terms uh, not just of stormwater separation, but also thinking about how do we optimize for slope stabilization? How do we improve air quality through what we plant? Uh, can we think about carbon sequestration? Our forestry department is starting to try to put some numbers to carbon sequestration for um, our 100,000 tree, trees by uh, the next 10 years goal. Um, and can we also be creating species habitat? Um, so I think, in, and to tie all this back to connecting people to nature, improving ecosystem health is really tantamount to connecting people to nature because they can't go outside if it's not healthy. Um, and then this is really a budget exercise is how I'm viewing this. Um, so what we intend to do with, over the next year is to analyze our current spending um, so is there unnecessary routine maintenance? Uh, and maybe I don't have enough time to talk about, uh, to get on my soapbox about lawns, but uh, mowing lawns is ridiculous, um, generally. Uh, and then someone can ask a question about my factoids about lawns. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, post-disaster costs, can we get ahead of those? So in 2018, the city spent about $12 million on landslide cleanup alone. That's not even mitigation or retaining walls. All of that is now happening. So any budget requests that were made for anything else really just went to landslide cleanup. Um, and then can we allocate, oh, another thing is deer fencing. We're spending an exorbitant amount of money on uh, you know, keeping fencing deer out, which I think is really problematic. It's eating the understory and it's 
um, you know, it, it's an issue for biodiversity. Um, and so, you know, can we allocate the resources to optimize our natural infrastructures? Uh, so we need to identify priority areas, which I already kind of talked about. Um, and then uh, also thinking about things like how can we use our buildings better? Um, so we have heating and cooling centers. Do we need to add, add air quality filters? Um, you know, can we green roofs? Uh, my colleague Flora, who's here, is working on net zero uh, energy for our buildings. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity with city facilities um, and the city green space. And that's, that's it. Thank you.